Um, I joined the team back in November, so I may be a new face to many of you, both newer members, longtime members, um, and I hope that I get the chance to meet many, as many of you as I can um, as we start up our, our in-person events again this year, um, and I'm glad to have you join us tonight. Um, also joining us tonight is Anthea Lavalley. Of, she is the executive director of the Hubbard Brook Research Foundation. Um, she'll be talking this evening about some of the research being done at Hubbard Brook Experimental Forest over in Woodstock, um, and more specifically, how they've seen things change as climate has changed. So, and Theo, we're excited to hear from you. Um, but before we get going, I have a couple housekeeping notes to run through quickly. Um, just to keep things running smoothly and less than any uh, confusion throughout Anthea's presentation, um, everyone's going to remain muted for the presentation. If you have any questions that come up, feel free to punch them into the chat box and we will, um, we will have XF, myself and Gall will be going through and um, taking your questions and sharing them with Anthea. Um, depending on how it plays out, we may share as we go, um, but regardless, there will be time for a more extended Q&A near the end. Uh, so definitely, if you have questions um, that you want to save for the end, feel free to write them down in the chat box on a scratch or loose leaf, and there will be time to get those answered. Um, so with that, I will hand it over to Anthea. Thank you so much, Jake, for that very kind introduction. And I'm just happy to see all of you, even though I think a lot of screens are muted. I know you're there and I see some familiar names. I see Chuck Henderson, who's a great colleague and friend. Happy to see you here. And, and just thanks for, for spending a, a cold, cold night chatting about science with me. I'm, I'm super excited to tell you about my work at Hubbard Brook. And I know we're gonna save the questions for the end of the presentation, but you can feel free to express yourselves with the reactions. So we'll, we'll do a little test of that now. If you have heard of Hubbard Brook before, and I know that some of you have, go ahead and use the raise hand function. I'm just curious. And that is in your lower right. Okay, I see some, I see a bunch. Okay, cool. Great. Well, you can go ahead and, oh, even more. That's excellent. And a heart. Sweet. That's good. So hopefully I will tell you a couple of new things and I'm expecting some really good questions at the end. And if you hear something that you like, you can go ahead during the talk and give me a, a thumbs up or, or be creative and let it rip and throw a banana at me, however you feel like expressing yourself as I, as I give this presentation. And so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Um, as Jake said, I'll be talking for a, a probably about 20 minutes or so, maybe a little bit longer if I slow down, which is a, a, a piece of advice I've been given not to talk too fast. And then we'll, we'll go ahead and do some Q&A at the end. So here we go. I will share my screen. Is that coming through? Okay, Jake, can you see everything? Great. Looks good on my end. Awesome. Okay. And so many of you already know, but in case you don't, I'll start with some of the basics about Hubbard Brook. Hubbard Brook is an experimental forest in the White Mountains of New Hampshire. It's just shy of 8,000 acres, and it was established in 1955, way back when, by the USDA Forest Service. And really basically, it was established at that time to understand the interactions among weather, water, and wood. And I'll unpack that a little bit as we get deeper into the presentation. Since those very, very early days where Hubbard Brook started with just a small group of, of visionary thinkers, it has expanded and really blossomed to, to become a collaboration of more than 25 institutions. So 25 colleges, universities, think tanks, research centers, many of them located here in New England and in the Northeast, but some as far away as the West Coast and even some overseas. And the Hubbard Brook Experimental Forest is kind of this magnet. It's sort of a, 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 a common ground that brings researchers together across disciplines and in some cases across sectors to understand our changing natural world. 
from those 25 plus institutions, we have 90 or so principal investigators, scientists who hold faculty positions, who are actively leading projects at Hubbard Brook. And that vast research collaborative is what we refer to as the Hubbard Brook Ecosystem Study or HBES. And there at the bottom of the screen is a picture of our annual cooperators meeting, which is a, a great coming together and kind of meeting of the minds of all of the people who are studying at Hubbard Brook, where they come together and share what they know so that we can all come away with a more complete understanding of our changing ecosystem. And you can see that they are all ages, all career stages, all curious about the natural world, studying things like animals, plants, air, water, human impacts, and how they kind of how all of those variables interrelate. I am not a scientist, actually. I have an ancient science, uh, science background. Long, long ago, I used to study tropical rainforests, but I'm a long ways away from there. And I prefer to study my backyard forests here in the Northeast these days. And I head up the Hubbard Brook Research Foundation, which is the science to society interface arm of the Hubbard Brook program. So very basically what I do and my teammates is we come up with ways of connecting the science and the scientists to people who are on the front lines of environmental decision making. And you may be wondering, well, who are those people? Well, well they're you. So it's basically everyone all day long, we're making decisions about the environment and how we use resources and how we wanna live in harmony with the natural world. But I also work with teachers and students and lawmakers, land and resource managers, you name it, anybody who can find science um, of service in their decision-making. So that's what I do all day, every day, and I love my job. So at Hubbard Brook, we have an interesting combination in terms of the science of long-term ecosystem monitoring, which is a regular rhythm of taking the pulse of the ecosystem across a variety of dimensions. And I'll give you some of those examples in the next slide. And then we also couple that with cutting edge experiments, sometimes at the entire watershed scale, we will do something to manipulate the ecosystem, oftentimes these days in order to simulate conditions of future climate change. So studying in some ways through experiments, the forests of tomorrow today. And then I'll just wrap up this slide by explaining that uh, Hubbard Brook is perhaps best known for discovering acid rain for the first time in, um, in the United States. That was back in the late 1960s. Hubbard Brook researchers who are still involved in the community today who made that discovery then went on to work with policymakers to institute the Clean Air Act amendments that continue to protect our air and water to this day. We also have a heavy, heavy focus on climate change, air and water quality issues, extreme weather and forest health. And up there, the, the top picture of those two handsome devils, that the, the gentleman in the sunglasses is our current board chair. That's Charlie Driscoll. He's a professor of environmental engineering at Syracuse University. He has masterminded some of Hubbard Brooks' most legendary experiments, and he's there with colleague and friend, Dr. Gary Lovett, who is an expert on forest pests and pathogens. And so I mentioned long-term monitoring, and I just wanted to kind of paint a picture of what that looks like. So at Hubbard Brook, we are taking samples on a regular time step, a regular rhythm, sometimes hourly, sometimes daily, sometimes weekly, monthly, in some cases every 10 years. It depends on what the measurement happens to be. And many of those measurements are coming through a, a network of forest sensors. So we call this a smart forest, where the, the forest is wired with sensors that flood headquarters with data, sometimes on an hourly basis. So it's really quite cutting edge at Hubbard Brook and other smart forests across the region. And we're measuring things like water quality and quantity. That middle picture is a kind of an old school sampling technique. There's a researcher there who's taking a stream sample and those stream samples and other similar samples get labeled and archived in an archive facility. There's a picture of a shelf there that we have on site at Hubbard Brook. 
We also have a carbon flux tower at Hubbard Brook for understanding air quality, so the chemistry of the air and also air temperature. We're studying winter climate change. There's a quite an emphasis on winter climate change, including snow depth. And up in the left-hand corner, that's a picture of a snow tube that we use to study snow depth and also snow moisture content. We also study the duration of the snowpack and how that's changing with climate. And then for the, for the animal lovers out there, Hubbard Brook is also home to one of North America's most continuous long-term migratory bird studies. It's more than 60 years of continuous study with more than 14,000 birds banded to date and more than 124 bird species identified. We have 60,000 tag trees at Hubbard Brook. And these, I mentioned some are, some measurements are taken every 10 years. This is one of them. So we go out and re-measure those trees and assess their overall growth and health every 10 years. And I kind of joke that at Hubbard Brook, it's sort of like a living Petri dish, but scientists there study everything from tree roots to canopy shoots, microbes to moose. The scientists love that watershed down to the molecule. And so now I'm going to get into like what have we learned for more than 50, in some cases, in some records, more than 60 years. What do we know now from that continuous monitoring? And so I'm going to cycle through a couple of slides here that tell you a little bit about what we've learned from that 50 year record, in some cases 60, of, of long term monitoring. And, and this is important and some of it is going to sound gloomy and doomy. But I think in order for us to shift out of the problem into the solution phase, we have to have a, a really strong kind of irrefutable, unassailable scientific understanding of what's happening in the natural world. And this is what long-term monitoring provides. Uh, an, an analogy that I often use is that it's kind of like you can't understand long-term trends without that monitoring. It's like trying to understand the stars without a without a telescope. You simply need the long-term records in order to reveal the trends. And now in this time of COVID, I think we've all become experts at interpreting trends. And without these long-term records, we simply wouldn't have an accurate understanding or ability to perceive what's happening with climate since it's such a long, long-term thing. So we do know that at Hubbard Brook, based on 50 years of monitoring, the air is warming. The average annual air temperature has increased by 2.6 degrees Fahrenheit. We also know that winter is increasing, is the fastest warming of the seasons, and it's, it's heating up fast. So 3.5 degrees um, Fahrenheit is the average annual air temperature increase in winter in the White Mountains. We're also seeing more precipitation overall. Average annual precipitation has increased by 12 inches. And we're seeing more of that precipitation coming in these short, heavy, intense bursts. These heavy precip events are increasing in frequency as well. We're seeing now 7.5 more days over that 50 year record of heavy rain. And by that, we mean a day where, we're, where there's more than three quarters of an inch of precipitation. We're also seeing rain is, is falling more often in the winter. We're getting these rain on snow events, which have some implications for downstream water quality. That water isn't getting falling and, and holding in place in, as snow. It's skidding off those slippery surfaces and into surface water. We're also seeing that stream flows are becoming increasingly variable. So higher highs and lower lows. When it comes to some of our amphibian populations, salamanders that we study at Hubbard Brook, that can be like a tsunami. These there, these, there are times in their breeding cycles where they can be very vulnerable to um, high stream flow. So that can be of concern to some animals. And then in terms of winter climate change, we're seeing that snowpack is decreasing in a couple of different ways. The average annual snow depth over the past 50 years has decreased by 12 inches. And it's also not lasting as long. Over that 50 year record, snowpack has decreased in duration by 24 days. So that's kind of like losing a month of winter, losing an entire month over 50 years of, um, of snowpack. 
We're also seeing fewer cold, cold days. We've lost 10 days over 50 years where the maximum temperature is below 32 degrees. And that might seem hard to believe we're in the middle of these cold snaps right now, but that's fairly significant. And there are some um, human health outcomes that I'll get to in, in the next couple of slides that relate to the loss of those extreme cold winter days. We're also seeing lake ice disappear. We've lost 25 days over the last 50 years of lake ice cover. So kind of like one, uh, one month less of snowpack, we have one month, almost one month less of lake ice cover. And in the, the spring, summer and fall, we're seeing those seasons changing as well. We're getting an earlier uh, leaf out in the spring and a later leaf fall for an overall lengthening of the summer, the, the spring, summer, fall growing season. And so now I wanted to shift a little bit about why does all of this matter? What does it mean in terms of our uh, economy, ecology, and culture here in New England? And so I wanted to zero in for this slide on winter recreation and what it, how it's changing in the White Mountains. Through a collaboration between Hubbard Brook scientists and our nearby Loon Mountain Ski Resort, we have learned that we've lost a total of eight days of snowmaking opportunity over the last several years. And seven of those days occur where there's loss of snowmaking opportunity during this crucial period right before the holidays, which is essential in our winter recreation economy. As I understand, I'm not a skier, but my ski friends tell me and our loon friends tell me that that's a really crucial time for, um, for, for income. Uh, people are really wanting to get out and ski at that time. And if there is no snowmaking opportunity that can really um, mess, mess with a, a tight budget. We're also seeing, and I'm sure you've noticed as well, that uh, small mom and pop ski operations are closing down. Operations without the massive snowmaking infrastructure, the equipment, the ability to move water and to have water stored in reservoirs, those small mom and pop uh, ski, ski operations have disappeared. And then we're also seeing that the snowmobiling industry is struggling with the loss of snowpack and lake, and lake ice that we talked about on the previous slide. And then, and I'm gonna have maybe one more gloomy slide and then we're gonna shift over a little bit into the solutions. But either way, I think the knowledge is important so that we can craft informed solutions in terms of policy and practice to deal with climate change as we work to, to to solve the root problem. But in terms of forest health and forest products in the White Mountains, what, what does this mean? And so we know that there are fewer opportunities for timber harvesting on snowpack. And that's important because harvesting trees and pulling trees out of forests on snowpack helps to prevent erosion and it protects sensitive root networks. It also does, it, it guards against uh, soil disturbance. So that's a pretty important thing to be able to do. And we're losing the opportunity to do it because of reduced snowpack and snowpack duration. We're also seeing that maple tree roots, which is a species of special concern and study at Hubbard Brook, are more damaged by the upheaval of frequent soil frost and freezing events. And this is leading to potentially, you know, the, the overall trees are, are not as able to thrive under those conditions, which leads to a lower maple yield and a potentially shorter sugaring, sugaring season. And I'm going to share a personal anecdote about soil freezing and soil frost right now because I'm going through a kind of upheaval on the home front. I'm here in my office right now because there's a massive construction operation at my house. I've lived in my house for almost 20 years. I live in Vermont, actually, so right, right next to New Hampshire, and I've never had a pipe freeze in all of those years that I've been a homeowner, but we had the cold snap last week, and lo and behold, the pipe that was my connection to the water main froze, and the reason for that, it's just like what we're talking about here with the tree roots. In the absence of insulating snowpack, my soil froze in a way that it had never frozen before, deep down to that pipe, burst the pipe. Now here we are, <laughs> plumbing, plumbing catastrophe, but it's sort of climate change um, on a, a smaller scale and how, how it affects us and how it's affecting me right now, which is pretty significant in my in my day to day life. So I, I hope all of your pipes are intact and and uh, well insulated through these cold snaps that we're having. 
So we're also seeing that invasive forest pests and pathogens are able to advance northward because our climate is becoming suitable and hospitable to them. And an example of that is the hemlock woolly adelgid. There are others, but um, as our climate warms, we're going to be increasingly besieged by these invasive uh, forest pests. And then we're also seeing ticks, mosquitoes, and other pests that are typically suppressed by those ultra, ultra cold nights, night after night of, of temperatures below freezing, we're losing those cold days. And so those insect populations, those invertebrate populations are just not being held at bay in the way that they were before. So we're seeing more ticks, we're seeing more mosquitoes. And of course there are human health implications for those as well with tick-borne illnesses such as Lyme disease and others and Eastern equine encephalitis from mosquitoes. So there are some um, pretty significant potential human health impacts from losing those cold, cold nights to climate change. Okay, so now that I've thoroughly depressed you, I didn't see any bananas coming my way, but <laughs> I guess everybody knows that, that climate change is real. So, uh, so it didn't, none of this took you by surprise. But I wanted to talk a little bit about how science can help to give us the lay of the land, but also point towards solutions. And I think there's great reason to feel very proud of what we have to offer here in, in our little home state of New Hampshire. We have a tremendous uh, treasure trove of science and academic institutions and a very robust and um, forward thinking forestry community. We have all the ingredients in place, I think, to be leaders in how we can uh, basically blaze a new trail for a forest based economy, ecology and culture that is um, that has climate change at the heart of it. And so an example of that, I mentioned that uh, we had some cutting edge watershed scale experiments at Hubbard Brook and Charlie Driscoll, the handsome gentleman with the sunglasses on on Capitol Hill in my first slide masterminded this one. This is the calcium addition experiment at Hubbard Brook's watershed one way back in 1999, Dr. Charlie Driscoll and his Hubbard Brook collaborators sent up helicopters to sprinkle calcium carbonate across that entire watershed basically to replace what had been lost to acid rain. Calcium gets leached out of the system due to acid rain. And there were decades of acid rain. The forest at Hubbard Brook was struggling and elsewhere in the Northeast. And Charlie thought, well, what would happen if we replaced it? If we simply fertilized that watershed and sprinkled the calcium back in? And guess what? That calcium addition did exactly what we hoped it would. It reversed forest decline and boosted carbon capture of that watershed. And I am really, really interested to the potential management applications of that kind of treatment in certain watersheds that are struggling with the aftermath of acid rain. We don't maybe don't need to use helicopters anymore. Maybe we can rig up drones that can fertilize watersheds to boost their, the, the overall health of the forest, but also um, carbon capture for climate change mitigation. And so there are also techniques that we can perfect through research of forest management for carbon sequestration, carbon banking, sucking the carbon that would otherwise be uh, contributing to greenhouse gas and, and, and global warming and banking it in trees. And so I don't know if you can see behind me, I have this beautiful bird's eye maple. That bird's eye maple is, is grabbing on and holding on to carbon right now. The, the table that I have in front of me is banking carbon right now. And there are actually ways that we can have our cake and eat it too through informed forestry where we can harvest trees in a way that mimics old growth forest in structure and composition that still bank significant amounts of carbon. It's not necessarily one or the other that you sequester carbon or you support a forest products industry. You can actually accomplish a wide variety of ecosystem services objectives if you have an informed forest management plan and science is a big part of that. And then my third bullet there, I, I might geek out for just a second, but I'm super excited about this. LIDAR satellite imagery. Um, New Hampshire 
is wall to wall covered in these very sophisticated LIDAR satellite images that have the ability to tell you what's going on across the landscape, but un also underneath the forest floor. So you can have a deep understanding and awareness of forest properties in a way that enables you to make informed management decisions. For example, you can understand specific soil properties so that you can make, make very precise matches between what should be planted there and what should be cut. You can understand where there are hot spots in a forest ecosystem that are, that are particularly vulnerable to um, extreme weather events that could release pollution and that, that could affect downstream water supplies. And you can manage carefully and sensitively around those hotspots in order to protect water quality. So that is, I'm fascinated by this. And, and we are sitting on a treasure trove of LIDAR images that simply need to be unpacked and provided to forest managers so that they can make these very, very sophisticated decisions about um, about the forests that they manage. It's it's pretty amazing. And similarly, based on research that we've done at Hubbard Brook, we know how to manage forests for water quality and quantity. And so the kinds of experiments that we've done, different harvesting approaches tell us what kinds of harvesting techniques can uh, increase stream flow, could contribute to, to flooding? How do we protect against erosion? How do we make sure that we're not flooding downstream water supplies through nutrients that are released through, um, through aggressive harvesting techniques? So those are the kinds of things that we've learned through our experiments at Hubbard Brook. And as I mentioned before, through collaborations with, with ski, So when they're, when they're going to occur, and some of our scientists, Lindsay Rustad, and, and he's all glazed over in ice at the bottom of my, my screen here, John Campbell, looking like Mr. Freeze, and Ian Helm, one of my, my great friends and collaborators at Hubbard Brook, thought, well, instead of chasing storms, you know, like tornado chasers, we're, we're not going to go out and chase ice storms, but why don't we try to make one? at Hubbard Brook, and that's exactly what they did. They, they planned and planned over many, many months, got NSF funding to do this, and then trekked out one morning in the pre-dawn hours when they knew that there was going to be this exact layering of, of air temperature. It's kind of like, I think of it like a hamburger. It's cold air on top of warm air on top of cold air. And they all of their gear prepared had fire hoses that they used to pump water up from the main Hubbard Brook in order to coat experimental plots with varying degrees of ice. And it was an absolutely stunning experiment. And we were able to determine that there is a particular tipping point when things really start to fall apart in a major way. And it's between a quarter inch and a half inch at Hubbard Brook that branches really start to fall down. And this has had helpful management science for smart policy, smart policy and practice. And we hold these convenings where we bring together um, the congressional delegation for science briefings so that we can share the latest what we're learning about our changing natural world at Hubbard Brook. And um, very proud to have had US Senator Jean Shaheen at Hubbard Brook in recent years, US Congresswoman Annie Custer. We've also held recent online brief briefings with Congress, US Congressman Chris Pappas. And it's just amazing to be part of a, of a state and a community and um, that, that really cares about science and is listening. And um, it's, we're just extremely, extremely grateful to have these relationships. And um, 
And one neat thing, I have a recording to prove it, but Annie Custer has committed Hubbard Brook Science to memory. And I've seen her and heard her invoke it on Capitol Hill. In hearings of the House Energy and Commerce Committee, she's used it to bolster her clean energy agenda. Uh, she used it for the Great American Outdoors Act and a number of other initiatives. And at the foundation, I should say that we are not an advocacy organization. We don't lobby for particular policy outcomes. We are equal opportunity when it comes to how we share the science. We advocate for science, but we're not lobbying. But it is incredibly gratifying to see um, our lawmakers really using the science in order to, to make strong cases for, um, for policy. And it was actually a, a briefing with Annie Custer that, that was the seed of an idea that has blossomed into a much bigger program, a youth engagement program, um, where we, I, I had organized a, a briefing for Annie Custer and her staff on Hubbardbrook Science. This was two and a half years ago. And in some ways, it was almost an afterthought. I decided, well, it would be really kind of neat to have a youth perspective. And so I invited a young student who was an undergraduate at Plymouth State University and had done an internship at the Forest Service at Hubbard Brook that summer. And I thought, well, it would be great to, to hear from her. And I'll be darned if she didn't bring the house down. After going around the table and hearing from some of the world's experts on climate change and a policy and water quality and air quality, this young woman had us all applauding and out of our seats and Annie Custer was like, practically in tears. And I thought, wow, you know, there's something really magical about young people who communicate from a place of scientific knowledge, but also hope and concern for their future. And what can we do to empower more young people to have a voice? And so we took this quantum leap in a couple of months. It was actually Annie Custer who suggested it. She said, if you really want to call attention to climate change issues, you should, you should consider hosting an event in the days before the New Hampshire primary for the presidential candidates. And I mashed up those two ideas in that moment. I thought, yes, we can have a, a climate and clean energy town hall, but let's make it youth oriented. And so that's what we did. And it was a, two February, three Februarys ago. So yes, two years ago, I and uh, colleagues at the League of Conservation Voters, the Union of Concerned Scientists, and uh, the Revers Energy Center at the Tuck School of Business at Dartmouth put on an all-day youth climate and clean energy town hall right before the pandemic. So this was a big in-person event in Concord, New Hampshire, that was really designed to empower young people. These were environmental students, undergraduate and graduate students. We worked with them to prepare questions for their panel discussions with the candidates. And it really illuminated the candidates' plans and positions around climate and clean energy at a crucial decision point right before the New Hampshire primary. And we were just so excited to give these young people this opportunity. And I, I all, of course, we had a ton of media coverage that day in Concord and all of the cameras and video were focused on the, the presidential candidates, but from where I was sitting, the students were the stars of the show. They were incredibly prepared. They were impeccable. They were brave. They were poised and their questions were just on point. And it was, it was amazing. And so we didn't wanna stop there at the foundation. We turned this into an ongoing program at the Hubbard Brook Research Foundation called Young Voices of Science. We launched it right after that event in 2020 and 2021, that academic year. And that first year, we put the call out and, uh, and we're, we were able to select 42 students for this free, these are environmental undergraduate and graduate students for free communications training and public outreach opportunities. So we bring in some of the, the, the experts across the country in how to write an op-ed, how to engage with policymakers, how to, how to tell the story of your science using a podcast or on radio or with empathy and storytelling techniques and rhetorical techniques. At the end of a, a five um, workshop series, their brains are packed with tools and techniques for how they can continue to communicate their, the story of their science. And then they engage in outreach projects, many of which have been published in, in um, national publications. It's just amazing to see what young people can do if you give them a little bit of tool, tool training opportunity and a big boost of confidence. It's, it's one of the things I'm most proud of that we're doing at the foundation. 
And that's a, uh, I thought it was a very cool logo that a, a youth artist designed for the program. And so just to, just to end here, what is it, like, just to summarize, what is it that we have to offer at Hubbard Brook? It's cutting edge science that's of global significance and it's homegrown in New Hampshire, which is such a cool thing. Like these are scientific facts that are setting and techniques that are setting a global standard and they're influencing national policy. And it's right here in the White Mountains tucked away. All of this, this work is being done. And we're growing our network of stakeholders. We're spanning sectors, we're, we're empowering young people at every career stage really to, so that they can be in, a, in the perfect position to share what they know and what their hopes and concerns are for the future. And then just in terms of science, by way of quick uh, summary, the kinds of things that we study at Hubbard Brook, it's climate, it's clean air and water quality, invasive species, extreme weather, wind, ice, flood, drought, changing winters, and carbon. And so feel free to take a screenshot <coughs> of my um, email. I would love to hear from you after the presentation. Please don't hesitate to reach out if you have questions or if you'd like to continue the conversation offline. Um, that's all I have for my presentation, but I'm looking forward to your questions. All right, thank you so much, Anthea. I mean, it's great to hear not only all the research that you guys are doing, but really all the implications of it and, and how you're how you're kind of breaking it down to actually be utilized. I always feel that's the hard part about the research side and the implementation side, like you spoke with the, the different policies um, that can reflect what you guys have found. So it's it's great to hear that all those things are are there with Hubbard Brook. Um, so right, we don't have any questions in the chat at the moment, it looks like, but if anybody has any questions for Anthea, you can just use the, um, either use a chat box or a hand. Um, so oh, coming in from Marilyn Booth, um, she is asking, is Hubbardbrook open to the public? I'm assuming she means to walk around, kind of poke around it is. It is absolutely open to the public. It's it's technically uh, a part of the White Mountain National Forest. So you can go in and you can investigate around. You can um, we have a guided a self guided tour, which you can download to your phone if you're interested in that. So you can learn a little bit about the science step by step as you meander through the forest and you may come across some research experiment plots where you might see flagging and you might even see a sign here or there kind of explaining what's going on. You might even cross paths with a researcher, which is super fun. <laughs> you can ask what they're up to and what they're learning about the forest. Um, because of the pandemic right now, the Hubbard Brook Forest headquarters um, is not open to the public. And so uh, that's a, a forest service regulation where we're down to a skeleton crew at headquarters. But you can get into the forest and, and walk around. And, and actually, if you have a group and would like a guided tour, I'd be happy to arrange that for you. So I have uh, a question just related to, um, I guess, the industry side of things is, has has Hubbard Books research or Hubbard Books staff ever kind of been used by some industry, whether it's ski resorts, whether it's um, the timber industry? Um, I mean, a lot of what you were talking about with the trees um, using, was it calcium to kind of mimic old growth um, practices? That kind of struck me as something that a lot of maybe Canadian old growth forest logging companies, oh, that's a good tactic to kind of mimic it. Um, so uh, has there been any communication with different companies, industries on kind of helping them um, kind of more responsibly go about their practices with Hubbard Brook? All the time. And it, it goes, I kind of think of it as a, a feedback loop where we're sharing what we know, but we're also looking to understand what the real world problems are so that we can synchronize our science to be more of service. So it kind of goes back and forth in that way. 
Uh, we hold roundtable conversations with stakeholders, for lack of a better term, around specific topics all the time for that kind of information sharing, where we will say, hey, you know, for example, we've had roundtables on the sugar maple industry, where we learn, like, what are they experiencing and what do we have to offer that might be of service? Similarly, we have conversations ongoing with recreation industry folks, uh, snowmobiling, AMC. We have a, a vast network of, of partners um, spanning all sectors and we're just constantly in conversation. And I think increasingly we will um, be partnering with, at least my hope is that we will be partnering with folks in the corporate sector as that becomes more of a of a pressing need. And I see that we have a trustee on the Hubbard Brook Research Foundation board, who's a professor at the Tuck School of Business at Dartmouth. His name is Professor Anant Sandaram, who was one of the first, I think, business professors to teach a class on climate change and corporate sustainability. And he, he, he called it many, many years ago where he was saying it's going to be incumbent upon um, corporations, because they're going to be getting pressure every which way in order to respond to climate change and other environmental issues related to water quality and quantity. So we're seeing consumers certainly are becoming more discerning. Employees want to work with corporations that express those values and shareholders as well are seeing this as the way of the future. And so Hubbard Brooks Science, I think, can absolutely play more of a role in the corporate sector. So yes, yes to all of it. And when we're constantly looking for new partners. So if you can think of anybody who might be interested in working with us and more locally, we've had amazing conversations with uh, in the corporate area with Stonyfield Organic, um, Cabot. So wanting to understand how they can be more efficient in terms of water use. Great. Yeah, that's, that's amazing to hear that you're getting involved on kind of uh, beginning to end yeah. of it. So it's great to hear. Uh, so we also, have, we have a second qu or another question from Chuck Henderson. Um, so he says, forests play a huge carbon role or a huge current role in taking carbon out of the atmosphere and the carbon can be measured somewhat in the trees and roots, but are you measuring carbon in the soil itself? Chuck, that's such a good question. And yes, <laughs> absolutely. Soil carbon and soil carbon banking is an area of, of intense research interest at Hubbard Brook. And, and Chuck has been to Hubbard Brook many times. And you've probably met Scott Bailey, who's a, a researcher with the, the US Forest Service, who's been at Hubbard Brook for decades. And this is something that he spends a great deal of time focusing on. And I, I mentioned, so he has a collaboration right now with professors at um, at the University of Vermont at the Rubenstein School, where they are, they are using some of these LIDAR images to understand what's going on beneath the forest floor in terms of the, the overall um, features and qualities of the soil. And the cool thing is, is that they're ground truthing, they're going in and I've been with them and done this, it's a dirty job, but it's super fun, where they, they punch a hole in the forest and they, they assess the forest soil profile and then they use that in order to ground truth these LIDAR images to see, okay, is, is, is that really what the LIDAR tells us should be there? And then the reason for doing that is that the LIDAR can help us to have this landscape scale understanding of soil carbon, just for one example, which is amazing. I mean, if we were able to understand how we can boost forest health and really invest in forest carbon on that landscape scale because of these LIDAR images, it's like, whoa. The way I see it, and I'm, I'm getting super excited when I talk about it, is that we have all of these key ingredients in New Hampshire. We have the science, we have you know, the, 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 uh, these incredible research institutions and, and colleges and universities that are collaborating. We have this robust forestry community and forest-based economy and culture, and we all work together. And I envision that New Hampshire can really be a national leader in, in how do we manage forests for all of these things, manage for climate, manage for carbon, manage for other ecosystem services, recreation, water quality, wild animals, I mean, all of the things, because we have the information to make these decisions, uh, really marrying cutting edge science and technology with our very rugged and rural forest-based economy and culture. 
How cool would that be? I mean, I feel like we can do it. I, I definitely feel like we can do it. Yeah, it's great to hear. And Chuck uh, mentioned this is the second time this week that he's heard the term ground truth. So I guess <laughs> the, the discussions are happening. <laughs> it's always great to hear. I bet it was the um, first time I, it was in reference to a soil pit. <laughs> <laughs> So um, we have actually two questions that seem like to go hand in hand, so I'll rattle them off together. Um, so John Jacker um, asked, how can we, so everybody help you as far as volunteers, um, et cetera. Um, it comes to, to couple with that. Uh, Kathy Fulkerson asked, does the research area utilize volunteers and citizen scientists? And if so, can you give examples of, the, of that work? Yeah, so I'll add, I'll answer the the John's question first. There are lots of things that you can do to to help at Hubbard Brook, and I think staying tuned is one where you can send me an email and I can subscribe you to our e newsletter, and that's a great way of just keeping abreast of the science and our various outreach projects and initiatives, and just continue to come. And we have lots of different um, speaking engagements or student projects. And if you can come and just show, show, you know, express your support by attending and spread the word to your friends about what we're doing, we're still kind of a best kept secret in some ways, Hubbard Brook. It's funny, if I travel to Europe for forestry conferences, people know Hubbard Brook, but, but a lot of folks even in our, in our local area don't know about Hubbard Brook. And in some ways, I think that's one of the biggest, best things that you can do is just let people know that we're there and what we're doing. Um, and, and become become a friend, become uh, a join a and become a member of our of our e news group. That's one thing. Um, we have typically when we're not dealing with a pandemic, we have the big annual meeting that I showed you a photo of at my the first picture. Um, you can come to that, and you can hear the very latest in terms of the science that's coming straight from the source, so from the scientists who are out there. And it's very high flying technical stuff, but it is an exhilarating atmosphere to be in if you like that kind of thing. So you can come and join us there. It's, it's scientific, it's also social. We're a very tight knit community. We have communal meals together. I'll even tell you, we do a barn dance at this at, <laughs> at, this, at this conference every year. It's, it's a lot of fun and it's just a great way to learn more about what's happening out there in the ecosystem. Um, we do have a couple of citizen science projects that are collaborations. One is a collaboration with TNC, one with AMC, and one with Squam Lakes Conservation Society. Um, I can tell you, because I don't, I, I think we're running out of time, but I can tell you a little bit more about those. And if you'd like to get involved, some of that might depend on your geography and where the, the projects are taking place. But um, but I'd be happy to, to send you links or also have a conversation offline if you think you might want to volunteer for citizen science projects through Hubbard Brook. Great. Yeah, um, and so if you have Anthea's contact information or want to go on Hubbard Brook um, and get it, great. If you would like to contact Gall or I or anybody at ACT, you can also put you through to her if you have any questions regarding any of that. I would be happy to do so. Um, so looks like we have we, so we have one more question and then we'll we'll let you go. Um, God just wants to know: Are you seeing any shifts in tree populations due to climate change? Yeah, we are. We are seeing some interesting shifts, and I, I think in some ways, at least the one that I see the most, and I think there's a, a climate component. But um, beach, and we're seeing beach bark disease that's kind of you know throughout the forest where um, there are these beach thickets that are that are the, a consequence of of um, that disease and the the combination of of forest pests and uh, pathogens. So that's one. Um, yeah, I mean, again, I would say we're seeing we're continuing to see forest regeneration problems, particularly with maple, and it's a kind of a one-two punch. So maple just isn't regenerating at the same rate that it used to. And part of that has to do with the legacy effects of acid rain. So even though we addressed acid rain through the Clean Air Act amendments of 1990, the effects are still playing out in our Northern hardwood forests. And so acid rain impacts of, on maple and then add to that the layer of climate change and stress 
And as I was explaining, the, the upheaval that goes on with the freeze-thaw cycles that are at increased frequency, it's just some trees are, some species take it harder than others and sugar maple is one of those. So they are not they are not thriving and regenerating in the way that they they used to, which is of some concern. Such an iconic species. Um, those are two that just that pop to mind most immediately. But there are certainly other climate change related impacts that are going to affect tree species composition um, as time goes on. So are, are there new trees coming north with that as well? Yeah, I mean, I think that's that's to be expected. So trees that we would typically see in southern areas are advancing and finding it more habitable. It's just possible for them to to move in here. Yeah. And then they find all their invasive species follow them. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I know. Oh, I know. Yeah, emerald ash borer was just uh, officially found. A young student researcher found the first emerald ash borer over the summer. And so we're now taking the opportunity to do an emerald ash borer experiment by protecting certain trees using the, the insecticide injection and then seeing how that, that which is a funny thing because the experimentally treated trees are actually more like a control because the, they're gonna be you know operating the way that they normally would while all of the other ash, we're expecting to lose more than 90% of them over the next several years. Oh, wow. Yeah. Well, can't wait to see the data on that. Yeah. Um, yeah, so looks like that's all we have for questions. So, and Thea, thank you so much again for taking the time to speak with us all tonight and, and field these great questions. And thank you to everybody who showed up and everybody who participated. I uh, appreciate you having here. Um, again, hope to see you in person as we do more in-person events. Um, so definitely keep an eye on our events page, our newsletter. Um, if you're subscribed to that, um, we will be having another speaker the third Thursday of next month, um, as well as through the rest of winter. Um, so definitely stay tuned for, for information on that and hope to see you there as well. Thank you so much for the opportunity, the invitation. It was wonderful to talk with you this evening. Stay warm. You as well. Have a good night, everyone. Bye-bye.